All right, well, we're running right now with partial audio. I'm not sure why the good audio is suddenly not working, but we're going to try one thing here. Talk about a case of the Mondays, right? I guess this is what happens when we try and do fun stuff, like go up to the living room and use the equipment. It's not muted. But for some reason, my computer is not seeing my nice, fancy microphone. I wonder if... I do something like this. Hey, there we go. All right. So, as I mentioned, case of the Mondays, huh? Uh, what a day, what a day, what a day. So, we'll sacrifice using the nice mouse today, I suppose. Um, as I was saying, my name is Mike Hess. I'm a respiratory therapist and the COPD dude. I run a Facebook group called COPD Navigator. And right now, our main goal is to raise COPD awareness. Um, a lot of what we do um, focuses on that and making sure everybody has the right resources for what they need to manage their conditions. Um, unfortunately, we know that's really tough right now in the era of the novel coronavirus. Um, starting to feel some of the effects of that myself. I keep catching myself in the mirror and the camera and trying not to break down and get one of those quarantine haircuts, but uh, that day may be coming. Uh, but in any event, i um, been doing this every weekday at 4 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time uh, so that we can all get together and have a little bit of fun, have a little bit of learning, all that kind of, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, this week, um, we're probably going to piggyback a little bit from last week. We've had a lot of fun last week with uh, doing some lip sync for lungs act action. We did um, harmonicas for health, and we'll definitely be doing that again on Wednesday. Um, thinking about doing that lip sync stuff again, thinking about, uh, actually a couple of different things. So, um, what I really need from you folks today is to tell me what you need to see, what you want to see, what, what do you want to see about, um, COPD? What do you want to know about how to manage your symptoms? What do you want to know about how to manage your condition? What do you want to know about being social? Um, we know a lot in a lot of places, pulmonary rehabs and stuff like that are still uh, locked down or, or not very available. And um, we need to try and uh, try. There we go. Hot mic. Hot mic. Whoa, hot mic. Um, uh, try and reduce some of that, uh, uh, try and reduce some of the barriers to getting to the information that you might normally get a pulmonary rehab. But we also want to make sure that everybody's having some good social time as well. Uh, one of the key things that often goes overlooked in pulmonary rehab is the fact that, um, it's a social environment. You've got people who are on the journey with you, walking the path with you, uh, and you might not be having that right now because this is uh, truly an uncertain time and, um, I'm hopeful that we are soon to come out on the other end of it, but uh, it seems like every time we take a step forward, we end up maybe taking two steps back. So um, we'll see. 
So let me know what's on your mind, what's on the collective mind of Navigator Nation. You can let me know uh, in the comments below or off to the side, depending on however you're, you're viewing this. Uh, we've got an email address down there. You can send us an email. You can tweet at us. Uh, you can find us on Facebook and on YouTube. Um, my biggest request of you right now, other than letting me know what is going and what you need to know, is to like, share, and subscribe these various channels so that we can continue to get the information out to as broad an audience as we can. Um, you know, hate to do the hustle and all that stuff, but unfortunately the name of the game on social media is engagement, and we need to make sure that uh, as many people are interacting with these posts as possible so that we can continue to get some of this uh, high-quality information out there. Uh, to that end, I have posted in a couple of different groups. Um, so if you see me looking over to the side here, um, this is me trying to scroll through and see where we have uh, some other comments and stuff. So we've got, yeah, there we go. So yeah, we had audio, audio, audio problems. Um, and now... You don't have to see microphones, just speak into them, yes. That is, uh, you know, the, it, I've got this guy here, um, works pretty well. The problem is it wasn't showing up uh, on my computer. My computer wasn't seeing it, and unfortunately, the computer needs to see it in order to talk into it. So um, I try to keep it somewhat hidden. Uh, I don't always do such a good job because I also want to keep it somewhat close to my face so that people can hear me. Um, as uh, longtime viewers may know, audio problems have been one of the hardest uh, gremlins to get rid of in all of the history of COPD Navigator Live and Breathe TV and all the various shows that we've done here. Um, it's been spending a fair bit of time trying to revamp how we're going to be doing stuff going forward. Um, I do hope to have the, uh, a new um, uh, website up very soon. Um, I want to have that be kind of a clearinghouse for a lot of the, uh, the Breathe TV and, and all these live uh, archives and things like that, as well as some of the other podcasts that uh, the, the one that I have started, the Potato Cast, it's uh, more of a general healthcare uh, situation. Um, and I've got a couple other ones on tap. Um, we'll see what happens. So, in any event, um, what is on your collective mind? Should we, uh, curious about one thing, didn't get a whole lot of feedback on this last time, uh, which was surprising because when I first started doing the live shows every day, um, it was one of the more notable things. So last week, of course, um, had a couple of different special guest stars. Uh, my daughter, Emma came down, uh, last Tuesday and gave me a little, uh, nail, uh, uh, manicure, I suppose it is. You know, almost said nail doodly do, um, but that's not what it's called. Uh, so uh, that was that fun. Did we have fun having Emma down here? Um, we had uh, definitely going to do Fitness Friday um, this week. I'm not sure. We had a dance off last week where my wife and I uh, did a couple of different uh, dances to the Just Dance thing. Uh, might end up doing another game this week or um, one thing that was fairly popular um, on my personal Facebook page, excuse me, talk about case of the Mondays again. Man, I need to get up and do some jumping jacks or something. I don't know. Played tennis for the first time uh, in several weeks. Yesterday, they finally opened up a couple of the parks and uh, we got the tennis rackets out and we're able to play outside a little bit. And um, really noticing that uh, I haven't done much activity. So um, still trying to get that up and, uh, you know, up and moving and all that kind of stuff. Hopefully, um, this week will go better with activity, although it's been kind of a gray, rainy day. Definitely a case of the Mondays kind of day. Um, so, it is what it is. Uh, but, let's see, what was I talking about here? Oh, so, um, do we bring Emma back in? Um, I've got, uh, my boys are back with us this week. Um, my sons, Joey and Tommy, they're around. We can maybe get uh, some more guest action going. Um, what is something fun that will entice you to share the video? Let me ask you that. Let me just be, get the shameless plugs out there and we'll see, uh, um, see what people have to say about that. It is unusual. It is odd. It's an odd feeling to, uh, sell like that. So I'm just not a natural at it yet. Uh, hopefully 
don't really want to be a natural at it, but might come to that point. You never know. Healthcare is in a very tricky time right now, and um, that is it's a big part of the reason why you know as as much as coronavirus and everything else is taking the public eye right now and as worried and frightened and upset and frustrated and every other negative emotion um, that many of us in healthcare and in the COPD community and everywhere else are feeling right now we do have to remember that this is a fantastic opportunity for us to have a bigger say what I mean by that is we're going to start writing you know, in the next three to six months. We're going to start writing the story of COVID-19. Technically, that's the disease that comes from this novel coronavirus, but it's what, you know, whatever we want to call it. It's like that, you know, it's like the whole thing with, with Kleenex. We know that not every facial tissue is Kleenex, but we all call it Kleenex, right? Or Band-Aids or, or whatever. Kool-Aid. <clears throat> we know that the stories of this pandemic are going to start being written soon. And we know that there are a lot of lessons to be learned. But as I talked about in the last episode of my Potato Cast podcast, um, which if I was hustling properly, I would drop a link in the comments, but... Um, to find it on uh, Spotify, Google Podcasts, all that stuff. Just search for Potato Cast and uh, look for the cat talking into a microphone. Um, we need to learn the right lessons from this from this pandemic, and that's one of the things that um, I actually I'm not even sure I know what the right lessons are. Of course, we all have our thoughts about how healthcare should work. We all have our thoughts about how. Um, healthcare delivery should work, how we should pay for it, all that stuff. And, and I'm by no means saying that mine are absolutely right or anybody else is absolutely wrong, anything like that. But what we know is we have a very inefficient system. And we know that because COPD is kind of the poster child for that. We look at how we manage COPD. And by and large, it is people who don't get diagnosed until it's it's well into the the advanced stages of airflow obstruction, which usually translates to more symptoms and all that stuff. We know that um, our testing isn't great. Our awareness isn't great. Our research isn't great. And so what happens is a lot of people with COPD end up getting most of their care in the hospital, whether it's in the emergency department, whether it's admitted. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but hopefully um, one of the people that you, you share this with, this is new information and it's catchy enough so that, uh, or, you know, if I got uh, media folks out there, you want to cut and paste some of this stuff. This is the key takeaway here. Most, many, if not most, people with COPD get their care inside the hospital, which is wildly inefficient. And it's also disturbing when we have a, a true crisis, like what we've had with the coronavirus, because all of a sudden, all those resources are gone. On, you know, it, it's more difficult, to, maybe not more difficult to get into the ER, but people are certainly more hesitant to go to the ER, the emergency department. Um, a lot of outpatient testing is delayed, postponed, canceled. Um, so many different things so many things that i can't even i can't even pull them all together there are so many things that oh when you have you know people tell me this all the time where they they they're having a symptom flare up but they don't want to go to the emergency room because they know all that the emergency room is going to do is give them a nebulizer or maybe three in a row nebulizers, some prednisone, maybe an antibiotic. They're going to watch it. And of course you're going to get the EKG. You're going to get the chest x-ray. You're going to get all the other dozen things. And really at the end of the day, the only thing that's going to happen is the same stuff you could do at home. But because antibiotics and steroids and all that stuff are, you know, well, they're controlled. You have to have a, a prescription and you have to be very careful about all that stuff. Because those are treated like that, 
people don't want to go to the emergency room because they figure, why am I going to expose myself to people being sick when I can just do this stuff at home? Or I can just give myself the nebulizer at home and maybe forgo the steroids. Or, or, you know, maybe I've got a batch from the last time I got sick and um, I'll just use them now and I'll have two days instead of five days or whatever. Or worse, uh, oh, I've got a, I've got leftover antibiotics. So I'll just take the three days that I didn't take last time, which is always a no-no, but people do it. And they don't go to the ER. And maybe they are sick enough that they do end up needing to go, but they don't go until they're a lot sicker than they should be. Or, well, you know what I mean. And then we have to put them on the non-invasive ventilator, the big mask, and, and blow the air into that. Or maybe instead of, you know, just paying for... I honestly don't know what the copays are, and, and I probably should. That's my privilege talking. But instead of paying the... 20 bucks, 50 bucks, whatever it is for a course of antibiotics and a course of steroids, suddenly we're paying $5,000 for two days in a step down ICU or something like that. Or worst case, we're paying $20,000 because you end up having to be intubated and you're in the ICU for three days. And the, even, even if that's not the case, you're sitting in the ER exposed to things like this coronavirus, exposed to the flu, which, you know, the flu shot, as great as it is, we don't always, it, it doesn't always protect as well as, as we would hope. So why are you exposing yourself to all these things? Where I'm going with this is we've got to take this opportunity to really look at how we have our healthcare system set up to deliver care. Because honestly, all the COPD stuff that happens in the hospital, probably 90% of it could be done at home or in the outpatient clinic. It isn't done because all those folks in the, in the primary care world, all that stuff are completely overwhelmed with everything else that's going on. And as somebody mentioned on the, on the, uh, um, uh, when I posted about this on my, on my personal page, uh, they're worried about healthcare satisfaction scores, and they're worried about this, and they're worried about that. And now, now we're going to be seeing a lot of these primary care places probably struggling financially a lot. And we've got to take this opportunity to make sure that our what that we don't just go back to normal, but we improve upon the normal, that we improve how we're delivering care especially for something like COPD. Again, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but this is the third leading medical cause of death in the country. Arguably, you know, depending on how you break down different types of cancer and things like that, because we, we tend to lump cancer into this one thing, where instead of having lung cancer and brain cancer and liver cancer and all that, we just have cancer. Similar with cardiovascular stuff, but if we if we break it all apart, COPD is probably the leading condition for mortality, leading cause of death in the U.S. Specific condition, and nobody still pays attention to it. We've we've had the COPD National Action Plan for three years now, four. Before I, were, before I started my current job, so this was this would have been, I believe it was the, uh, it took about a year, I think. To, so 2015, 2016, we've had it four or five years. And we haven't really gotten all that far. And, you know, I, I, and, and it's just, it's difficult. It's not anyone's, any one person's fault. I've been part of that myself. We had a subcontract from NIH that didn't go as smoothly as we had hoped. You know, that, that we kind of pinned a lot of hopes on that. And it, it just wasn't as successful as we would have liked. And, we, and a lot of reasons for that. It's hard to get anything started. It's hard to get that that first push of the snowball before it starts, you know, rolling downhill and becomes the avalanche. It's really hard to sustain that. And when people don't know what COPD is, when people don't know how to handle it, when people don't know what to look for, then you can have billboards and you can have community events and you can have all this stuff. And it's still not maybe necessarily getting the eyeballs. It's still not getting onto the news. It's still not this thing. 
but we have an opportunity to make it the thing because what coronavirus has done, it has not ruined the healthcare system. It has revealed the deficiencies that have been there for a while, particularly with chronic conditions, like I said. And what we need to do is get back to, and I don't even want, no, no, I don't know, back to is the right word because I don't know that we've ever really had it like this. Um, you know, I have been in healthcare a relatively short amount of time. I've been in healthcare about 15 years now altogether between education and all that stuff. So, I, you know, I can't speak to what it was like in the in the 70s or in the 60s or anything like that. Maybe once upon a time, we did a better job with chronic stuff, but we also had less chronic stuff because the other thing we don't talk about in healthcare, and we don't talk about this in COPD and stuff either, is again, that activity, the nutrition, the, 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 the front load of stuff, the things that make you unwell or that contribute to unwellness. We don't talk about that stuff either. And, and again, we need to, and we need to set up the system so that we can deliver that kind of information. We've got a really nice debate and going on again on my, my personal page. And I haven't really disagreed with anything that anyone has said, very much. I mean, you know, of course, again, going back to the whole idea of we all have our theories and, you know, we won't know what the right answer is until we try it. And by the time we try it, then, you know, if, if we don't get it right, then it's going to waste a lot of money, so on and so forth. Um, the very good points that have been brought up is we have this, this idea in healthcare about what we tend to call frequent flyers which is not a very nice word. Uh, it's something that I've been guilty of using back in, in the early bits of my career, and I've realized why that's not the best way to go about it because by and large, people don't like spending time in the emergency department or in the hospital. And even when they have a bad attitude, there's usually a reason for it. Um, yeah, I know a lot of people who are, are I know somebody who is going through a lot of stress right now. They've got a, a loved one in the, in the hospital, um, still unclear whether it's COVID related or not. And they were telling me that, you know, they've been really struggling with, with eating. We'll go back to, to nutrition and stuff. And they just want to eat a lot and they want to eat what they want. They don't want to follow the rules of being on a, on a diet or, or healthy eating and things like that. And if you get into the psychology of it, it's because that's something that you can control. You can control what you eat. And again, you can get into the, the um, psychology of like eating disorders and stuff too. Usually they come from some kind of, of trauma or, or stressor or something like that because you may not be able to control your COPD symptoms very well. You may not be able to control your loved one's situation in a hospital or wherever they're at. And it's stressing you out because you don't... you. One of the worst things for humans is to not have that control. And so you find something that you can control. You can control your diet. You can control all your vices, cigarette smoking, all these things. Well, you can control those things. You may want to, you know, you may tell yourself, well, I'll quit next week or I'll, I'll eat better next week or I'll exercise more next week. I, I've told myself that a lot. Um, but you can control that. And so the, the idea that you can control it with something that is soothing, like a security blanket, is very powerful. And a lot of times, because when you go into the hospital, you lose a lot of your control, your personal autonomy, your agency, all that sort of thing, you lose that control. Doctors are telling you what to do. Nurses telling you what to do. Respiratory therapists telling you what to do. Uh, all these, you know, you're on schedules. You, you go here at this place. We're going to take you down to CT at this time. You're going to have a meal at, at this time. You, you, you need to get up and move around or, or um, you know, blow on your acapella or whatever um, at, at this time. How many t you, you lose that control. And sometimes the thing that gets you control is the fact that you know because our, our system is rigged for certain things that you have to be satisfied. You have to be happy. And so maybe you yell at the person who's taking care of you or you have a bad attitude because that's something that you can control. And it's unpleasant. 
I've been on the receiving end of that many a time as a healthcare provider. But if we understand that, if we understand what's going on, it can make it a little bit easier for us to at least deal with it or to really figure out what the what the problem is. My wife is very fond of the saying, seek first to understand. And that is really critically important. Um, that's what we need to do as healthcare providers is to is to first change our mindsets because and, and realize that we don't need to just eliminate the frequent flyer. We have to figure out what makes them a frequent flyer in the first place. We have to realize that social determinants of health really are a thing. We have to realize that structural biases in our healthcare system, in our economic system, all these places really are still a thing. We have to, we again, may not necessarily agree on all of the, the results and all of the, um, um, the way forward, but we can't even start to discuss that until we at least come to terms with the idea that these things exist, right? And it's difficult because we want to deny that they exist. We want to know, we want to think that we're better people. I want to think I'm a better person. I'm not. We all have weaknesses. We all have struggles. We want to believe that we are better than, than the bad things. And so we, we really have to wrap our minds around the fact that just be, and this leads me to another, and I know this is turning into a rant and I'm sorry if I've lost the entire audience, I'm sorry, we'll just throw this one in the garbage and, and try again tomorrow. But, um, I'm not sure why anymore it's this cardinal sin to acknowledge that you may have made a mistake or to, that you were wrong about something. I don't know why it's so hard these days to say, you know what? I was wrong about that, and I'm sorry. I owe you an apology. I see that in professional life. I see it all over in, in personal life. Not, you know, our, our circle's pretty good about it, but I see people interacting with others all the time, and it's like, to be wrong is okay. That's part of being human. It doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It doesn't mean that you're weak. It doesn't mean that you're a failure. It just means it didn't go right. You, you were wrong. You had bad information or you made a wrong decision or you made a wrong evaluation. I mean, that happens all the time. I, I, I think about that. I've really been thinking about it a lot over the last six weeks or so because I was one of the people that kind of figured, um, like like they say in that movie, uh, Shaun of the Dead, it's like, eh, it's all blow over. We'll head down to the pub, have a pint, and it'll all blow over. But this bugger has really affected a lot of the economy or a lot, a, a lot of society. Now, obviously, the economy and the, a lot of those effects are still to be to be seen. It has affected health care. It has affected our social relationships. We don't know what social stuff is going to look like going forward. I've seen a lot of memes that, um, you know, are, are is the handshake over? I don't know. I, I probably should be. I mean, because if it's not the coronavirus, it, it's something. I mean, we know that, you know, unless you have really impeccable hand hygiene, that's a great vector for disease transmission. So maybe we should go, maybe we should bow. Maybe we should take a, a look to some of the Asian cultures. Maybe we should look to um, Judaism, which is where this originally came from. You know, whether we want to call it a sci-fi symbol or, or the, um, it was, um, it's the shape of an S, I believe, that Leonard Nimoy decided to, uh, he saw it in his synagogue when he was growing up and he decided to make it a symbol of peace. Maybe these should be our greetings. Um, trying to remember where I was going with it. oh we need to realize that maybe we have some false assumptions about healthcare and about a lot about a lot of stuff and work to fix that and again this is the key time for all this as as bad as the transition has been we can use it as an opportunity for good. We can make it better and we can improve things, but we have to be able to, again, look at and have a real clear-eyed approach as to what works and what doesn't and what are our priorities. Are our, our priorities making sure the insurance companies survive and continue to make millions of dollars hand over fist? Maybe. 
Maybe that's the way to do it. I personally would not prefer that, but maybe I'm wrong. Is the solution uh, government-controlled health care like in the UK? Maybe. We have a surprising amount of... Well, we have a surprisingly... I, I think if you actually look at how things work... I think a lot of people would be surprised at how little government run healthcare is actually government run because we look at things like Medicaid and things like that. A lot of that has been farmed back out to the private sector and it still looks bad because it's still Medicaid, but it's not the government that's making all the decisions. And again, I'm not saying that that the government should. It, it, it's I don't know. You know, the 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 Germans have a pretty good mix of uh, public and private care. Uh, the Canadians have, um, as I understand it, a f decent enough mix. With, you know, most of it is private care or uh, um, public, government subsidized, evil socialism, whatever phrase we want to put on it. Um, but there's also a private support system if you if you choose to go outside of that and you have the means to go outside of it, so that you at least have a safety net. And that's what I think really the, the key point to all this is, is, you know, we keep looking at this, this bilateral solution where we either have health care safety or, you know, public safety, or we have an economy. And I don't think it has to be that way. I really don't. I don't think we have to sacrifice some people's health in order to save the economy. And I don't think we should necessarily throw away the economy to save health. I think if we have a rational evaluation of our priorities, we can make it work. But we have to make sure that we're taking this opportunity as a community, as partic and, and uh, particularly as a, as a chronic health community and everything else. We have to have that, that single powerful voice to get out there and, and say these things. And we have to be ready for it. So, that went on a little bit longer than I thought. Let's see if I've actually got anybody still with me. So Joe, Joe Morrison, who um, is one of those people who actually is having some success in his um, awareness stuff. And I know um, hopefully he can, he can uh, build on that with another round of uh, NIH stuff says that failure is a key component to success. Absolutely. And anybody who knows me well knows that I tend to think and speak in pop culture references. Usually sci-fi, um, sometimes uh, action, comedy, or uh, comic book kind of stuff, and some comedies. And one of those lines that has always stuck with me from uh, Batman Begins, it says, why do we fall, uh, the, Bruce Wayne has fallen down the, the well, um, and he's got all bats all over, all over the place and he, he's scared. And his dad eventually comes down um, with the line and pulls him up. He says, why do we fall? So that we can learn to pick ourselves up again. But somehow we've gotten to this point where falling means that you're done. You're a loser. You're a failure. And, you know, and we, we, and this may seem like an inspirational talk, but this is critical for, for actually healthcare provision too, because, this is why so many people still smoke. Because as clinicians, whether it's we don't have time or we don't have the background, whatever it is, we look at, you know, we see, oh, you're a smoker? Well, why don't you just quit? Oh, you're overweight? Why don't you just uh, um, eat less and move more? Oh, you're this? Well, why don't you just? It's never just. It's again, you know, it's the thing you can control. It's your safety blanket. It's your security blanket. It's your habit. It's your ritual. It's your, it's your identity. It's your social circle. It's, it's all of these things. And sometimes if you, 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 we've gotten to the point where if you fail in an attempt to quit smoking, to lose weight, to start new habits, then you are just a failure. It's not that you went down a dead end of a maze. It's that, well, now I'm a failure. Now there's something wrong with me. So now I need something else. Now I need to either just give up and, and keep doing the thing, 
or I need to um, get a medication for it, or I need counseling, or you know, I and, and again, all of these things can be entirely appropriate in the right settings. But if we just went back a couple of steps and said, okay, so you failed this time, let's look at why. Let's look at how. What can we do different in another attempt? You know, again, we go back to the maze analogy. If you go down one thing in a maze and you you hit the dead end, you just stop there. I mean, I guess, you know, if you're doing the maze on a, on a placemat at a restaurant, remember when we could go to restaurants? Then, you know, when your food comes, then maybe you stop. But if you're actually trying to get through the maze, no, you back up and you go a different way. So why don't we do that in life? There's your homework for Monday night going into Tuesday. We'll, we'll discuss tomorrow. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's go back a little bit here. Let's look at what you did right. Yes, James, exactly. Thank you. I, I'm sure I'm missing a whole bunch of other comments. Exactly. It doesn't have to be, the, the, the focus doesn't have to be on the failure. And, and I know, I know, James, I, I know that's, that's what I'm saying. That's why I loved, I actually loved the, the discussion today. I haven't really had a chance to, to actually discuss, but I've really enjoyed the interactions because while I know that, um, and not to throw you under the bus, I know you and I have had our differences about how healthcare should be structured. This particular discussion, we all agree. And again, this is the beautiful thing is we can have those respectful discussions about how do we implement where we want to get to. And the truth of the matter is probably somewhere in between. We'll go with another pop culture reference, uh, Star Trek VI, Kirk and Spock, two of my favorite characters of all time. Um, although I have to admit, I've been leaning a little bit more Picard these days, been sharing the next generation with my kids while, that, while they've been uh, trying to teach some of those lessons and all that. You know, Spock is, is very logical, very stoic, very serious and all that stuff. And Kirk, uh, I think he says something about he always goes where angels fear to tread. And reality is somewhere in the middle. Buddhism teaches us this too. One of the, one of the most interesting classes I took uh, was one of those general ed blow-off classes for my bachelor's degree. was a Buddhism class. And... Um, the, the one of the core tenets of Buddhism is to find the middle way. You know, you don't want to be, you know, just completely deny yourself everything like many um, uh, monk religious monk, you know, those kind of religious orders um, do. But you also don't want to be decadent and debaucherous. It's the middle because neither one of those is sustainable. But what is sustainable is the balance. You may have some tension and you may lean back and forth a little bit, but you're going to, this is going to be a sustainable path. If you have the debauchery, then you're going to get, uh, um, hypertension and <laughs> liver failure and everything else. And if you're the aesthetic, um, that's just kind of going against human nature, but if you can find that balance, then, then you're good to go. So if we can continue to remove some of the polarization in our politics, in our healthcare discussions, all of these things. And it, because it doesn't have to be right or wrong. And again, it's human nature to get passionate and worked up and all this stuff. Obviously I've been, I've been unwinding for about 40 minutes here. Um, I didn't have any of this stuff planned. I didn't really have a whole lot to talk about anyway. I, I thought we were going to have a lot of talk about, you know, what, like what songs I was going to sing later in the week or what color my nails were going to be. Um, but this, this is, again, this is important stuff. If we can get to the idea where it's not that I have to be right and I have to convince you of my rightness, but that we, I am, I am partly right. You are partly right. Let's look at those things that make each other right. And then let's also look at why we think those other things are wrong and see where that common ground is and see what we can form together because that's where it's going to be. And I know, again, this is kind of turning into this whole happy uh, got to be together thing. And that doesn't seem realistic in this kind of in, in this day and age, but uh, hope springs eternal. That's where we've got to be. This whole and this whole thing started again with we have to get this message out to more people, if, especially in healthcare, especially in a group like COPD community that has been underrepresented for a very long time. Got to get that seat at the table. 
Um, let's look at what the patient did right up to feeling to the point that they failed and build on that exactly. Um, the important part is absolutely. We keep discussing this stuff. We keep discussing it and we keep being mindful that none of, you know, the, 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 I am not just healthcare, Mike, believe it or not. I know a lot of people probably think that, um, I eat, sleep, breathe respiratory, and that's the only language I speak. And, and sometimes even the family thinks that, but there's more to it than me. There's more to it than, um, sure. I could rightly, I, I'm sure I could be described as bleeding heart, liberal, feel good, touchy feely, hippie guy. There's more to me than that. There's more to anybody than rugged individualist or um, granola mom or soccer mom or gun guy. I mean, everybody is the sum of all of their parts, and there's usually something we can figure out. Now, you, there are certainly things that um, may end up being incompatible. And that's okay too. You know, there, there's a, there are times where people just end up being too much of a stressor. And, and again, that's okay too. You don't have to be friends with everybody, but we do at least have to, if we're going to be stuck in things together, if we're going to be trying to find solutions, we at least have to try to find that middle ground. All right. So uh, now again, that was pretty solid unwinding of a half hour there. I'm going to see about scrolling back up maybe. So, um, Rachel says, uh, miss my pulmonary rehab peeps. Even the RT who rubs me the wrong way. Hey, again, you know, not everybody is going to get along. Not everybody is going to. I mean, maybe someday, if we get to that whole Star Trek uh, future, maybe we do all get along and sing Kumbaya and all that stuff. Maybe we, maybe we do get to that point. I, I don't think that's really human nature. We're always going to have people that rub, each, rub us the wrong way. Um, you know, there, there are people that, and again, it comes down to that control. You know, we don't like necessarily being told what to do when it comes to exercise or anything like that. And when we have to do a thing that we don't want to do, then we lose some of that control. So don't need to apologize for that at all. Um, so. Hi, Andy. <laughs> You're scrolling back there. Sorry about that. Uh, I kind of got on that tear and just had, I guess I kind of had to spit it all out there. So. Uh, I'm also going to try and circle around to some of the other groups where I have posted the video today and see if, um, I can find any other comments or anything like that. doesn't look like a whole lot going on, so that's probably not the worst thing. Um, of course, that also may mean that I just lost everybody while I was, uh, on the, on the tear there. So, uh, James says, I will probably start a storm here, but at some point we have to get patients to understand the importance of taking steps to take care of themselves and have some ownership and accountability in their care. They have to first want to do it, ask the right questions, and accept the education. There really is a lot of psychology in healthcare. And um, I suppose it might start a storm. Wow, it sounded really, really northern there for a minute. It could start a storm, but again... I may not have used those exact words, but that concept is 100% right. My job as a clinician, and I'm very upfront with people about this, when it, whenever, whether it's smoking cessation, whether it's um, using their, their inhalers or whatever therapy it is, the same thing with pulmonary rehab, all that stuff, I can give the tools. I can teach you how to use the tools. I can show you how to use the tools. I can help you, to a degree, use the tools. I can give you the, the, account, the understanding. I can give you the reminders. I can do all of that stuff. But, pop culture reference number three, there's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. 10 points to whoever knows that, that reference. There's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. My job as a clinician is to give you the tools to walk the path and to hopefully give you the motivation 
to do that, to walk, the, to know the path. I, I, I tell you how to know the path and hopefully give you the motivation to walk the path. But the goal or the, the motivation and has to end up being internal. Again, kind of the whole middle way thing, external motivation is rarely sustainable because as soon as you stop seeing me or whatever clinician, you lose that motivation. And again, we're, we're never going to be able to escape the system where you can't come and see me once a week, often might not be able to see me once a month. So that motivation has to come from within. Now, what we can do as clinicians is to work with the person to find that motivation. It's this whole idea of motivational interviewing and, and goal-directed therapy and things like that. And it's important to find the right goals. And that's where I would argue that we as clinicians fall down a lot. Um, you know, we, we talk a lot. I, I went to a conference not terribly long ago. I'm not going to say where. I'm not going to say who it was. It was not around here, so none of my local people can are worried about it. That was uh, supposedly targeted at patients. The whole idea of it was this is a a patient-oriented conference. Um, We're going to have patient-oriented information to give out, all this stuff. It was put on by clinicians. It it was kind of like a, a big seminar for patients and caregivers. And uh, have a good day, James. Thanks for stopping by. I appreciate it. Um, We will definitely be continuing this conversation at some point, I'm sure. Um, So this this thing was, was aimed at patients and caregivers, civilians. And yet, the language that was used was still very technical, jargony, medical terminology stuff, you know, and so when we talk about treatments and therapies, um, we talk about things like, well, we can improve your FEV1. We can improve your lung function. But what does that mean? We, the more research we do, the more we know that that's not necessarily tied with symptoms. And, it's, and that's not necessarily tied with quality of life. Usually symptoms reflect quality of life. But FEV1 and lung function, all that stuff, that doesn't necessarily correlate. So if we tell somebody, well, I'm going to improve your FEV1 10%, what does that mean? Unless you are a respiratory therapist, a pulmonologist, Maybe certain other internal medicine physicians, maybe primary care docs, some nurses. You know, if you're not in, if you're not in the know, if you're not in the club, you're not going to know what increasing your FEV one means. So, how is that going to motivate you? It wouldn't motivate me, and so then if if I take that tack of it, well, as a clinician. Uh, this is what I'm going to tell you, and you should be happy with that. And then when you come back and we maybe do the, the spirometry again and it hasn't changed, then, you know, what's the point? We, you know, again, we get into that whole failure spiral. But if I ask you, what do you want to do that you can't do right now? Go to the mailbox. I want to go to my granddaughter's wedding in six months. I want to go fishing. Fishing, uh, that example, that, well, the, both of those last two, those are, well, actually all three of those at one point or another. Those have all been actual goals that, that I have worked with. And um, if, I, if I then say, okay, well, here's what we need to do. You need to take this medication twice a day, once in the morning, once at night. You need to take this one, two puffs in the morning. I'm going to write all this stuff down. I'm going to give you an action plan. I'm going to give you all these instructions, reminders, all that stuff. I'm going to show you how to use these devices, all that stuff. And if you do this for three months, I would bet that you can do your goal. I I would bet that you can go bowling, go fishing, go on that trip. I have had 
patients who want to use their inhaler less, their, their albuterol, their, their short-acting inhaler, their reliever. And I've said, well, okay, well, before if you want to use it less before you take it, do some perslip breathing. Because most of the time, your shortness of breath isn't going to be because of the thing albuterol fixes. It's not going to be because of the bronchospasm. It's going to be because you've got air trapping. And, and if you're fully dilated, as most people are, because you've been doing your nebulizers and stuff, the short-acting albuterol isn't going to help you. And sure enough, people come back the next month and either they're mad because I got in their head or they, they agree that they're using their inhaler less. It's all about finding the goals, finding the motivation. All right, so that brings us a little bit past 5 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, that, ha- that brings us to the end of the hour or so. Um, great time to get in any last minute questions. I'm still trying to circle through some of the sites here. Uh Oh, internal server error. All right. So I lost some of the chat. So we'll have to go back and find the chat. So while I am doing this stuff, and hey, nine viewers right now. Thank you for sticking with it. Or showing up just in time for the end of my rant. It's hard to say. Um, While I'm doing this, again, I would encourage everybody to like and share and subscribe and get all this stuff information. This is, um, This is really important stuff. Obviously, I think so. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Apparently very important to Joe also. Great presentation, he says. Uh, I mean, I can can go on about this stuff all day long. I mean, this is, obviously I'm passionate about it. Again, I I want to, it comes back to the whole motivation thing. If this is what I can do to get people motivated to, again, take the next step and to, to do emails and letters and all that stuff. We've got virtual advocacy stuff coming up all the time. Um, we've got, we're trying to get more people involved with the COPD coalition. We're trying to get, um, you know, when November comes back around again, um, COPD awareness month. We always need, and then again, this is coming up on the time where we're going to need to sit at that table and say, this is what we need for, you know, everybody's talking about lung stuff. COVID-19 is a lung disease. COVID-19 is probably going to have long-term lung follow-ups. It's a thing that we've noticed with a a lot of those patients. This is probably going to lead to long-term health problems, long-term lung health problems. It's time to look at lung disease more seriously including COPD. And so how do we do that? So this is a great time to do that. Um, uh, so I say something about COPD. Shirley, hello. Thank you for uh, for joining in. Do you, if you've got a question, we've got lots of stuff available. Um, we talk, we've talked a little bit about COPD. Uh, today we've talked a little bit about um, the physiology of COPD. We've talked a little bit about um, the importance of advocacy for COPD, um, how we need to start doing a better job at getting people COPD information and care. If you have a little bit more specific question, that would be fantastic, and I would be happy to answer that for you. If you want to think about it, um, we'll definitely be back tomorrow at 4 p.m. Um, and Joe, uh, doing another right to breathe webinar at four thirty or seven. Um, we got to coordinate with that a little bit more. Um, so what I will, that mean, cause that means I will go on at three 30 so that we can lead into right to breathe. Um, and I keep forgetting when those are, which, which week those are. So, um, but we'll definitely, um, Joe is going to send me an invite. We will drop that on the COPD Navigator page. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Joe's Right to Breathe Foundation um, has done great work 
um, at the very least in the Northeast, but uh, I believe all around the country, um, using uh, racing events, uh, uh, drag racing events to raise awareness for COPD stuff. Um, and also lately they've been doing a lot of, um, um, online events like we're doing here and some, some, uh, um, some, uh, um, interactive stuff, uh, I think with the blue jeans platform. So that's kind of nice to be able to get a little bit more, uh, FaceTime. Um, hopefully I'll be able to stick around, uh, for the whole thing tomorrow, um, at 4 30. Uh, if not, I will definitely still lead into it and push people in that direction. Um, and uh, by the same token, Joe, if you could let people know, um, at, we'll go on at 3.30. And uh, we'll be doing this all week. Um, tomorrow, we don't have quite a topic yet. Wednesday, we will be going back to the harmonica. Um, for those who didn't make it last week... The harmonica is a great tool to help with some lung health. And again, once we get into a more social, physical time, we can get a little bit. It's a great, fun group activity. Um, so we'll do a little bit more of that on Wednesday. We'll have another harmonica show uh, later on in the week. We'll see what happens. Um, we'll put some polls out and see what people are interested in, what people might like to hear or see. Um, Kim, thank you for checking in. Appreciate you, uh, you stopping by and, uh, glad you found it interesting. Um, you know, again, I get passionate about this stuff and I know I got kind of wound up today, but, uh, um, uh, that is what it is. It's a show for everyone. Uh, <laughs> no worries, Joe. I could probably intuit out the situation at some point, but, uh, um, so 4.30 or 7 from John, um, we'll definitely uh, try and get one of those in, um, see what else is going around going around on the old homestead, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, let's see, just going to go around the horn one more time and see if, uh, share the COPD Navigator video feed on here. Thank you very much, Joe, appreciate that. Um, like I said, any anybody who's willing to like, share, and subscribe would be uh, very much appreciated and very helpful in uh, me trying to reach my goal of getting everybody involved in COPD advocacy and uh, being an effective advocate for the community. Uh, so with that said, I think that... Um, maybe it didn't show up in that group. That's weird. Maybe those posts have to be approved. I don't know. But anyway, um, oh, okay. So Shirley does have a question. I can barely walk from one room to another without running out of breath. My lifestyle has completely changed. Uh, and unfortunately, that is quite common. Um, but there may be certain things that can be done about it. Um, you know, we know that COPD care in many parts of the country is a little bit substandard, suboptimal. Um, if you were my patient, the first thing I would do is find out what medications you're on and whether you're taking them appropriately. That means whether you're taking them often enough or at the, the right frequency. Some of them are once a day, some are twice a day, that sort of thing. I would also want to make sure that you are taking them appropriately. I have a couple of different devices and one I left uh, upstairs, but I have this device that can help me figure out if you're using your meter dose inhalers correctly. I have another device that helps me figure out um, if you're taking your dry powder type inhalers properly. So I would figure out if you're doing those properly. And if you are, then we would look for other things to try. And if you're not, then we would figure out why. Um, sometimes the powder inhalers are just too hard to inhale. Sometimes the puffers are too hard to squeeze. And so we would find the right regimen for you. I would also do some additional testing to figure out if there's anything else going on. I have had people who, um, probably not quite to that extreme or that degree, but people who have had been told they've had asthma or COPD for a very long time and have found out to have something wrong with their vocal cords or acid reflux affecting some of this stuff. So we do some testing about that. Um, 
We would see if you needed any oxygen. We would see if you were appropriate to go to a pulmonary rehab program once they start opening up again, or if we can get you on some kind of exercise activity regimen. We would be doing um, a lot of that stuff. I haven't seen lung specialists in about three years, so again, not terribly uncommon. I would highly recommend you try to get in when you can. Um, I know it's easy to say, not as easy to do. Um, hopefully, um, we can start working on changing that. My role right now is to be a um, respiratory specialist in primary care. I'm not a full pulmonologist. I, I don't want to do, I, I can't do, and it would not be appropriate for me to do a lot of the more advanced things, but I can do a lot of the basics. I can do a lot of the um, figuring out what meds you should be on and all that kind of stuff and teaching you how to use the stuff. And you can see me a little bit more frequently. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we know a lot of parts of the country um, have difficulty with accessing stuff. Hopefully, that's also where some of this technology can come into play. Um, we have the capability now to do visits over... The internet like this to actually do secure clinical visits over the internet um, where I can sit and I can watch your breathing pattern and I can see how you cough and I can have you uh, truly I left my pulse ox down here didn't I well no I did I can have you um you know we'd be able to answer if you needed to be on oxygen because I could have you put on a pulse ox, get your oxygen level. There we go. Am I alive? There we go. I can have you show me your oxygen level, and I can have you get up and walk and have you show me your oxygen level. Um, or, you know, eventually we'll get to a point where we can have a Bluetooth connection, and you can send me that information, you know, again over the Internet. There's a lot that we can do with telehealth. Uh, and probably a lot that we're about to do with telehealth because that's, what has you know this has been kind of a learn on the go thing with a lot of the practices shut down and things like that we've had to do telehealth and it works it really can be efficient like i said I, i've had this this facebook group for six years now and again i'm biased and i recognize that but i truly believe that we have made a difference in a lot of people's lives because we've had a good mix of some clinical information to avoid the disinformation or misinformation or misunderstandings that can go out there um and we've had a lot of people who are on the journey we've had a lot of great people like um like uh john um and joe morrison who have had family members or who have copd themselves and are willing to share their stories so if that basic level of telehealth can be effective, absolutely more clinical telehealth can be effective. And then we don't have to worry about transportation anymore. I have a boatload of people who have trouble getting to appointments because they uh, can't catch the bus or they didn't call soon enough to get their Medicaid provided transportation uh, or they had their ride cancel on them. They had a family member who had to work suddenly or whatever, and they can't get to their appointment. And so then that's more time that's lost. But if we had a, you know effective telehealth integration, we could fix that. We could still service that population. So, um, yeah. So if you were my patient, those are the things that I would start with, and then I would see you about once a month or so until we had you locked in on a program. Um, so you, you mentioned that you need to be on oxygen. You're sure of that? Um, okay. So then the biggest next step for you is going to be able to, is going to be um, contacting a pulmonary specialist, a pulmonologist. Uh, let's see where, let's see if I can pop in real quick to see. I just reloaded the page because, oh wait, the chat, well, I got to look at your profile here. Um, so let's see where you might be located. So So living in Houston, Texas, shouldn't be um, too much of a shortage, shouldn't be much of a shortage of pulmonologists around there. Um, I know uh, 
um, San Antonio I'm a little bit more familiar with, but uh, um, I can really point you in the right direction in San Antonio. But, uh, well, I guess most of the docs I know there work for the VA. But um, Houston's got a lot of good pulmonary docs. Um, so my advice there would be to definitely contact one um, as soon as you can, as soon as they are seeing patients for intake again. It's, if it's been three years, they'll probably want to do an intake visit for you. Um, some of this stuff could be done through um, primary care, but that's, especially in the initial stages, you're probably better off going to pulmonology unless you can happen to find a primary care that has a, uh, has a uh, um, respiratory therapist on board, but that is tough to do. Um, so I would do those things. I would, uh, um, that would be the first steps. And then, like I said, were you my patient? Um, I would want to see you uh, in about a month and um, see where things are. So, okay, I think... So I hope that answers your question to a degree. Um, and I hope that uh, you're, that kind of accommodates the whole thing about saying something about COPD. Hopefully um, that uh, points you a little bit in the right direction. Um, it's difficult to, at first, and it's particularly difficult at first to kind of lock in on the right therapy. Um, that's why we got to have that kind of, follow up. The way mine usually works is I have you follow up monthly until we get you in a good plan. And then we go either three months or six months, just depending on how stable things are. So, um, yeah, that's what I would do. Uh, I need one close to me because my lung specialist who works in the office dismissed me because I didn't come in because of the coronavirus. Wow. Um, that I would agree that you need a new lung specialist because of that, because I don't, I personally don't believe that somebody should get dismissed for that. I think these have been some very legitimate concerns and, um, I think that would be a problem. So I would, uh, um, definitely encourage you to find a different office to go to. So, and hello Rose, hello Rose. I see you checking in just about the same time there. So Glad to see you were able to make it in a little bit today. Um, we are coming up on 20 past 5 o'clock. And for today, that means we're going to start wrapping things up here. So I do appreciate everybody spending some time um, with me on uh, the Monday here. Uh, hopefully you didn't have too bad of a case of the Mondays. Mine are feeling a bit better now, I will say. I had a bit of that uh, going on earlier, but uh, hopefully we can get that fixed up. Um, again, we're looking at uh, tomorrow. We'll be on at 3.30 so that we can lead into uh, Joe Morrison's Right to Breathe webinar. And we'll have some more information about that on the COPD Navigator Facebook page. Um, if you're not already a member of our group, I encourage you to join there. Uh, and also follow us on uh, YouTube. Uh, like, share, and subscribe uh, if you prefer that over Facebook. Um, any of these things are going to help us get the word out about uh, what we're doing and try to help connect more people with the information they need. Uh, so until tomorrow, folks, I hope that you stay safe, that you stay strong, and that you stay home. And I hope that you keep breathing lightly. And um, it's gonna, it'll be a good day. <laughs> So uh, until then, until tomorrow, uh, my name is Mike Hess. Uh, this has been COPD Navigator House Call, and we'll see you tomorrow. Take care, folks.